welcome to Movie Review Mom. Today, I have a very special guest I want to introduce to you. His name is Greg Lynch, the writer, producer of The Last Captain. That's me. Which is super cool. And um, I actually did an interview with Greg about his movie that he put together. So be sure and check that one out. Um, and he and I have known each other since junior high. Oh, dear God. <laughs> we were in <laughs> choir together. Come on now. <laughs> we did choir and drama. I don't know. We probably had math class together. I don't remember. I, 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 I definitely know we were in choir. I know we, we, we did. We did Bye Bye Birdie together. I definitely remember that one. Yeah. Well, today he is going to help me do a movie review of the movie Welcome to Marwin. He and I both saw the movie, and he also saw the documentary because he is a completist. Sadly. <laughs> I, 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 if, if you want to enjoy Welcome to Marwin first, a little bit more, don't see the documentary first. Oh. Because I spent a lot of the movie comparing the documentary to the movie, and the movie... It was like, well, why, you know, it was so interesting in the documentary. Why didn't they bring it over to the movie? Oh, okay. But anyway. Now, we haven't discussed this yet. So on the count of three, tell me what grade you gave this movie. And then I'll tell you my grade. Ready? One, two, three. D. Ooh. Well, I'm hard on movies. I, you know, you, you spend a lot of time watching movies and you, you know how they should work and, and it's, it gets to be as well, why didn't it work this way? You you know the tools, you have the tricks. You should have done better, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I know Greg and I, were, we've talked about this because we were both looking forward to this for months. He said, oh, when that comes out, I want to be your guest. Uh, so I was like, yeah, and the trailer made it look so interesting. There's some really cool special effects that sort of, plasticize people's faces and bodies is that how you would describe that oh well, well they, they look like puppets it's like you know and it was this dolls. Th th they had these dolls that they were going to be alive and they were going to tell this you know fantasy really movie together using this and i mean the thing about zemeckis is he's always finding new tools that are fantastic to tell his stories you think back to forrest gump for instance and just the way they would interweave Forrest Gump into live action movies and just the special effects and but at the base it was a very human tale that we could all relate to about this young man yearning for love and chasing the woman of his dreams it was like oh my god and the way it all went together it was fabulous and he does that a lot he, you know you think back to the future again this fantastic story that's again about young men trying to do things and it's and it's fabulous it's like, well here's a great fantasy movie that Zemeckis is going to put together. And by God, I want to go see that. That's my number one film to see. Oh, and it was about a man looking for love. It was. So where did it go wrong? I think, um, there were, I, well, if we divest ourselves from the source material and we look at the film by itself, I think all the characters that surrounded Mark, who's this, you know, Mark Hollenberg is this man that has this traumatic injury. A and true in order to, story. It, as far as he, and to deal with that, he, de de he develops this fancy world with puppets and this town, and he films it to help with his own therapy to overcome his injuries. But all the people around him are very one-dimensional. They're all, they're all super nice to him, first of all. And this is like, you know, you're, as opposed to your idiosyncrat idiosyncrasies are getting on my nerves. I really don't want to. And so everybody was very nice and pleasant and supportive of him, but it was all, they were written to serve the role rather than being characters you could kind of believe that were acting with Mark in the story. And I, that was one of my first, like, you don't have, you know, you don't have any depth to your character. You know, you're, you're just the friend. You're, you know, you're the supportive friend. You're the, you're the bad guy. You're the, the love interest, everybody had one note. That's true. Yeah. And I, you know, um, and the story was very simple. There wasn't a lot of complexity to the story. And I think the main big, uh, the, the 
catalyzing event, let's say in the movie, happens off screen and it's already done. I mean, he gets att- I mean, it's not giving anything away. He gets attacked and brutally beaten outside a bar one night, and that's where he gets suffers brain damage. But that happens before anything happens. So the rest of the movie is after that point. There are some little flashbacks, obviously, where you do sort of relive that with him. But, um, and one thing that I was surprised about was, I, I, you, you know, in the trailer, basically the premise of the whole movie, right? Right. Um, but one thing the, the trailer didn't reveal was the reason he got beat up, which I was not familiar with that. I actually had even beforehand gone onto the website and looked at some of the artwork and the installations and, you know, to learn a little bit about him. I didn't watch the documentary like you did, but I just kind of wanted to get a feel because the story is compelling. But it didn't say anything about the reason why he got beat up, and um, which was well, he, he go ahead. <laughs> he liked to wear women's shoes, and I think uh, which is it, it, it's of a very sexual nature. And I think on purpose they didn't want to give that card away. When I was watching the documentary, that came up, and I was like, oh wow. Because I haven't seen anything about that in the in yeah. the feature, the Hollywood feature. How are they even going to deal with that? Are they going to show it? And and they did, but I don't think they delved into it. It was just another quirk of his character. It was just, oh, he's quirky. <laughs> but he had a real, you know, that was his, part of his coping mechanism was wearing women's shoes. And, and, and it wasn't because he wanted to be a woman so much. He felt he had a greater connection to women by wearing their clothing. Right. And what was interesting is at the beginning of the movie, you see him wearing women's shoes and you're thinking, oh, that must be part of the effects of being beaten up to the point of death and having brain damage. But later you learn, no, he had that quirk long before he was beat up. I I don't know, I should say quirk, propensity or whatever, fetish. Um, And I like the way that he described it, though. He said, I feel a connection to women's essence. And he, he wasn't a homosexual because he had this crush on this woman. And so you didn't get that, but it was definitely treated that this was a hate crime. And that could, I think, explain why everyone was so kind to him. He suffered a, a, such a cruel, senseless, um, traumatic event. And it was a hate crime. And so this all leads up to, will he defend himself in court? Will he muster up the courage to to do that. Um, and even the court scene was a little lackluster, I, I thought. Well, I, it, I well two courts. Like, he goes to court twice. I got the, I mean, the court was, was something they manufactured to, to build drama. I mean, they oh, gave- it didn't happen? Well, not in the, do, it, it happened, but it was like the whole film was kind of structured around him going to that court. Mm-hmm. And it was like, we don't, in the doc, okay, it's it's unfair to compare the documentary to the to the movie, to the to the feature, but in the in the documentary, it's like it's just his journey of recovery, and he didn't really need to go to court to have that moment, but I think in you know in a Hollywood film, you need a moment, you need to drive towards something, and they said, okay, let's let's have him confront these the people that beat him. And we'll make that his mountain to cross, and that'll give us the arc for the film. And and looking at it, it was like it was very you know stagey. Let's let's go to the court. You know, if we, if we can have him be on this hero's journey to go to the court and resolve his issues, you know, and he and he gets that cathartic moment. We can all have that cathartic moment with him. And it, for me, it was very blatant that they did that. That's- yeah, and I kept thinking, all right, it's building up to this. I expected some big moment. He gives a speech, but it wasn't the big payoff that I was hoping for. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and it was just, and you, by by showing those bad guys, you, you give them credence, where it's not his interrelation with those people that destroyed his life. It's the story should be of how he recovers, how we use this beautiful village of Marwin and his photography and his art to to somehow heal himself from that traumatic event. And I think one of the ways that Zemeckis kind of failed is he, he didn't examine that closely enough. He didn't really go down that road. He, he, I think he struggled with the story and he threw in stuff to, to make it a story. 
Yeah, although there was one element that I that I actually liked. Um, there was a character, a little doll, and her name was Deja. And she didn't look like any of the humans that you see. All the other dolls clearly match a real life person. And there's this other sort of mystical doll that he sets up on a little, um, a little cupboard or whatever. And she has this mystery around her. And I kept thinking, when is she going to be revealed? When are we going to learn? Who is that real person? And uh, I, I actually liked how that slowly evolved until really towards the end of the movie. And that gave me more of a payoff, I think, than the court scene. Um, should I spoil it and say what it was? I, no, I don't think so. I think let it go. I, I, I do like the way the director used the doll because there was a lot of scenes where you could see her in the corner. Is yeah. like, or one specific scene, you could see her legs dangling over the top of the screen as he's talking to somebody yeah. who's trying to make a decision. You could feel her presence forcing him to do what she wanted, basically. He was like in the thrall of the doll for a lot of the film. Yeah, so I thought that imagery, I loved the symbolism. I thought that was powerful for what it represented. It, yeah, it did. And it, but yeah, again, it was, I don't know. <laughs> it was, it, it seemed stagey again. It was another, it was, I, it, it, I, I felt manipulated a lot, but not, <laughs> not in a, not, he didn't manipulate me well, which is what he should be able to do. Aww. I mean, a director should be able to play on your emotions to do the beats, to get the things going in a subtle way. So you're not realizing, I mean, how manipulative they are. And in this case, I, you know, one of my other big critiques was a lot of expository dialogue. Right. Like, hey, let's go, and this is what happened to me, and I did this, and that's my friend, and we did this, and I'm like, you have to be subtler about it. You have to yeah. build that's those. It's kind of a pet peeve of mine when the director has to tell you what's happening versus showing you what's happening. Yeah, right. but there because of the backstory and the history and all of that, you know, um, yeah, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of that. What about the casting? What about Steve Carell and some of the other I, I love I love Steve Curl. I think he does a great job. Um, but I I kind of misused maybe in this one. Uh, he didn't. He seems to play that kind of damaged character a lot. You look at uh, I'm gonna have to come up with names, but that type of guy, and it wasn't really a big stretch for him. I think to play that character. Yeah. Um, He's lovable. I mean, you, you get him on the screen, and anybody who's a fan of The Office just will say, "Sure, bring it on." Oh yeah. <laughs> I thought he was great. I thought he did a good job. I, I liked all of the female characters. And I really liked that he was surrounded by female characters. Uh, they were all the good, good guys. And then the bad guys were all men. And again, I think there might be an audience of women who really embrace some of the message behind the story, you know, just the essence of woman. In fact, um, his character, he says to somebody, um, you just don't get it. Women are the saviors of the world. Oh, yeah. And so I think a lot of women will go, yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> oh, I think, I, I think that was, I, no, that's completely true. I, I think that was, he was like, he was looking for women as a support group, and, yeah. and they did. I, I, I just, but they all, it, they all seemed very similar. They all were very supportive, and I don't know if that's, but they were supportive in the same way. And Yeah, that, yeah. Well, now with all of your experience in filmmaking, you have been in the filmmaking industry for 25 plus years, something sure. like that, <laughs> and doing all kinds of stuff. Um, so as far as the actual set pieces and the world building, um, what did you think of that? Because I, I was really intrigued by the blending of real world and the, the doll world, the Marwen and the the dolls and all of that. I, I did love, I thought, I, I think I spent a lot of, I was like, okay, where is, you know, did we use the full plastic face or did we blend some of the actual face in for a lot of these shots? And some of the, in just some of the times it was, um, it was, it was fabulous. You know, you got that fantasy feel is like, but I shouldn't be looking at how the dolls are working and in the dressing, but it was, it was so well done. I mean, there was a lot of attention to detail. There was just, some of the sets were fabulous, and you're like, well, they had to build a full-scale teapot to make that teapot scene, right? Right, they yeah. Be, you know, and 
And so, yeah, I think though, I mean, one of, okay, we're, one of my other things is that Zemeckis, I think he kind of lost focus in the big battle sequence at the end. They're in the town at the, and he gets into the time machine. Right. And it's yeah. like, well, that's Zemeckis' old time machine. <laughs> it's like, okay, are you going to hit us on the head with a throwback to one of your old movies? I get, I, cause that's exactly what I thought too. I was like, really? <laughs> uh, really? Was that in the documentary or was that totally fabricated? No. In the, well, in the documentary, the time machine is, it's, you know, he's watching that porno film. Yeah. In the documentary, he does the same thing, but his VCR destroys that tape. Oh. And so he takes apart the, the, the VCR and makes the VCR into a time machine. Oh. And he gets, and they showed it and it was like, yeah, there was time. And, and one of the reasons that Marwin, he could retell the stories of Marwin over and over again, was that the, the, the girl would get into the time machine and go back and, and resurrect people or stop them before they did things and they would go on on different things. So we'd have the stories keep going and going. And that's why I was like, but then the time machine and <sighs> <laughs> I just, I was like, please, please don't do that. Aww. And then the, well, the second thing that was pointed out to me was all the Nazis died like they do in Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> At the end where everybody, that's that, it is like, okay, come on, two in that short span of time, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to rip off Raiders and you're going to rip off one of your other films. That, that's true. That's so funny. Um, and, and I like the one character, Nicole, she says, it's pretty violent, but at least all the Nazis are dead. <laughs> that kind of made me laugh out loud. So, and in fact, talking about all the Nazis dying and all of this, um, how family friendly do you think this was? Because when I first saw this listed, it was as rated R, but now it's listed as rated PG-13. So what did you think about the content for parents or people that are um, a little worried about that? Because well, there's I, a lot I think of dying Nazis. There's a lot of dying, but they're dolls. Yeah. And, the, and there's bunch of, I mean, I think one of the is the fetish sequence. I mean, something you might have to explain to your children about how older people you know, fantasize about different things. And that's this, and that might be, you know, tough for younger kids, but um, the violence was all very cartoony, sort of, you know, you didn't see, you know, gallons of blood or, you know, violent things that you can cut. There was through. some blood, but it's sort of cartoony blood. Right. And but was, you do see puddles of blood, you know, next to people that have died and that kind of thing. Well, and there's lots it's... of violence, you know, there's lots of shooting, lots of shooting. There's Very torture. Violent. But it's dolls, so. It's dolls. I think one of the things that kind of helps that is there's the one man that was on the steeple and he gets shot, and which is one of the, the things in the trailer is like, oh, that is hysterical. He fell and broke apart and it was doll noises. It went from yeah. this very realistic soundscape to that clack that the doll broke in half. Yeah, and yeah. And you kind of laugh and like, oh, that's funny. Right. And there's a lot of that, which I think is really cute. Mm -hmm. um, but I mentioned this because it has dolls. Some kids may think it's a kid-friendly movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think the themes aren't kid-friendly. No, I, I think yeah, it's I agree. very, it's very, it's a very adult film. It's about a man that's, you know, dealing with trauma and how he does it is kind of childlike, but it, again, it, there's, it, there's a sophistication to it of, you know, if you want to see a man that's working through the problems that he's lost his memory, he can't, you know, write anymore, do the things he used to do. He has no memories of anything that happened. The only thing he has is picture. So it's kind of, it's a little distressing to see, a, a, you know, a, an adult be in a state of, you know, real distress. That's true. So now um, to finish up, are there any themes that you could say that are worthwhile that you could pull out and apply to your own life or... Uh, recommend? Uh, I mean, it, I, I think the thing is, it was great in theory, is that <laughs> here's a man using art to, to heal himself. And that's a, that's, a, that's a powerful message is to, yeah. you know, he goes out and he takes photographs to, of the world of this very specialized world. But, and, you know, it's like, and that's what art should do to you. If you go to a gallery or you see something, it's like, let's have art heal ourselves and use, you know, art to empower ourselves. I just don't think he really carried that message out well enough. 
you know, he, he, you could see the message there. And I think part again, as I saw the documentary of what was supposed to happen or yeah. what happened in the documentary world. And I'm, he didn't quite encapture it as well. I think he got lost in the technology. Let's say it's like, I'm doing this really interesting thing and maybe that should be enough. You know, I'm going to make dolls look like a real world and I'm going to cut back. And so the story and the themes didn't really get paid enough attention in this film. Yeah, I love what you just said about art and how that is one of the purposes of art, to heal us, to help us see the beauty in the world, to help us see other things in the world that maybe we're not seeing. I think that that is a good, strong message. And certainly loneliness, friendship, addiction, pain. You know, one of his, one of the women who helped him in recovery, you know, she said, you got to love the pain. Pain is our rocket fuel. It helps us to remember that we're strong and uh, that kind of carried through throughout the whole thing that he needed to embrace the pain and move move past it sure i think one of the things that they one of the other ones that was was there too was it's okay to be different i mean here's this man that gets beaten up because he's different and in today's society that's it's like you you should be able to be whoever you want to be you shouldn't be beaten up for what you believe or what you think you should. And, and that's kind of there too. And it, I think that's another big message that should be there. It's like be yeah. yourself and it's it, don't denigrate other people for being different. I think we're seeing that actually in a lot of movies, certainly all the superhero movies. Oh, sure. I mean, most of those superheroes are different. Um, but I remember, um, well, I mean, there's been so many, the, the greatest showman, certainly celebrated how different we all are. And it just seems like in a lot of my movie reviews lately, as I list all of the themes, I'm, I'm listing embrace who you are, you know, don't let anybody else define you. And, and um, that, that's great. And you're right. That's certainly another strong lesson uh, that we can learn from this movie. So I guess the lesson learned is go see the documentary. I, the 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 doc, again the documentary is good and in comparison to the movie the film the Hollywood film it's great but the documentary is good it has a has some different I think the documentary focused more on his art it's like and it's and you didn't really get a sense of why the art was important and why I mean why is this guy taking pictures of dolls that's going to be in a gallery but in the documentary they really go through the photos that really encapsulated what he was going to do and you didn't in the movie itself, there's a lot of photos of the, the girl dolls and him and a lot of, you know, but in the documentary, it's more the war. And then that's what he was fighting. He was fighting a, an internal war mm-hmm. and he uses his photographs to show this, you know, he used external war to kind of mirror what was going on inside himself. And that's how he kind of dealt. And the documentary kind of goes through that a lot more than the movie does. Interesting. Well, I'll have to check that out. Before we go, tell me, what is your next project? You just finished The Last Captain. So what's your next project? I'm working on another documentary about another fencer. His name is Michael DeSaro. He was a uh, international saber phenomenon during the 60s. He was the top American saber fencer and just this huge, and he he ran afoul of the, the powers that be and he was kind of excluded from being a fencer. But he picked himself up and he made himself a, 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 a big coach and became one of the top United States coaches. He had the top women's coach at San Jose State University. We might be familiar with that. Wow. And, and we're going to tell his story and hopefully it'll be entertaining enough. <laughs> and when is that going to come out? When can uh, we look for that? The, well, the editor is going really slow and is not really doing his job as well as he should. <laughs> so it's a little behind, but probably in the next six months. Did you also write that film? Uh, yes. And I'm writing it with my partner, Doug Nichols. We're, again, it was Doug Nichols and I. We got the money. We went out and we interviewed 50 people all across the United States. And we had way too much story. I mean, there was, everybody had a story. One of the jokes was like, everybody has a Michael DeSaro story. And everybody <laughs> did. And they were all different. And they were all interesting. It's like, okay, what stories are we going to use? So. Well, I'm so impressed with this, the whole filmmaking process. It's easy for me to sit and watch a movie and say, yeah, it was good. No, I didn't like it. But you're actually out there making movies, and that's so cool. Thank you. Well, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, somebody's got to make them. And it's, <laughs> we talked about this before. It's, 
it's the technology is now is that it's there. You use your computer and you can go out and, and do it. But you also have to have the creativity and the vision and the talent, and you certainly have that. So Greg's, all of Greg's information will be down below in the description. Definitely check out The Last Captain. And Greg, do you have any other parting words for us? <laughs> well, you can find out more about fencing at the West Coast Fencing Archive. You can, and I think that's the best thing you can do. You can follow us, West Coast Fencing Archive on Facebook. You could follow The Last Captain on Facebook. And uh, we have some stuff up on YouTube too at the West Coast Fencing Archive. Okay, great. And of course, be sure and subscribe to Movie Review Mom. And all of my deets are down below as well. In the meanwhile, Greg, it was, it's always a pleasure to see you. And I'm sure you're going to be joining me again next year, 2019, for some more film reviews. You bet. Um, and so until then, have a wonderful time at the movies. We'll see you later.